Hello there and welcome to the Independence YouTube channel. Uh, I'm John Rental, uh, and I'm joined today by Kate Devlin, the most recent addition to our politics team at the Independent, who joined us from the Times at the beginning of the coronavirus crisis. A brilliant journalist and uh, welcome to our video review of Prime Minister's Questions. What did you make of it, Kate? Was it not a news fest, wasn't it? I mean, you know, I just made a couple of notes about uh, about U turns um, uh, and announcements. I wanted to get to a couple. I mean, he even just on free school meals, um, he announced that people with no recourse to public funds would now be eligible to, to free school meals. That just appeared to be off the cuff as he was being asked about it by Keir Starmer. Um, he said he was concerned about the actions of some companies and how they're treating their um, their staff during coronavirus. I mean, that's a news line in itself, isn't it? Um, and on the NHS surcharge, he promised it would be back to you to because nothing seemed to have happened since he announced it. So it, it was it was quite a kind of packed, full NHS uh, PMQs, wasn't it? Yes, um, I thought so. I mean, the prime minister seems to be making policy uh, at the dispatch box. Uh, but I noticed <laughs> that to... delightful for his staff. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I noticed that opinion on my part of Twitter was very divided about uh, uh, about the clash between Keir Starmer and Boris Johnson. There were some people saying that if Jeremy Corbyn had failed to lay a, a land a blow on the prime minister like that, then you know all hell would have broken loose. And others saying that uh, Boris Johnson was extremely weak in just. Uh, trying to ask questions of Keir Starmer about, about whether schools are safe for children to go back to. Uh, which, which do you think is more accurate about what was going on? I don't know. I mean, to be honest, I thought both of them were kind of fascinating. Um, I'll tell you why. I mean, first of all, I thought this, this continued argument about kids going back to school really told us something because, I mean, at the start, I was thinking, why did he, why is he, talking about this so much, but actually most kids can't go back to school. You know, and the, we, Gavin Williamson had to do a U-turn last week and say, you know, actually, wait a minute, you know, we're not gonna be able to, to get there, certainly for primary school kids um, by the end of this term. Um, so I think I think he's, he's definitely picking something up. He's picking something up in public opinion and he's really trying to set himself um, on the side of, uh, uh, of uh, parents in this. Now, whether this will work, remains to be seen because you know he's definitely trying to overturn something which is you know appears to me to be fears that he's not on the side looking as if he's on the side of parents of this um and then the other thing i thought was this this government is quite good actually at taking what appears to be quite strong criticisms about it and starting to make it work for themselves so i thought there was a really interesting line where he talked about how the um the research and the new inquiry into race going to have to be a thorough piece of work because uh, recent events have shown us that that is what is required and it just reminded me of do you remember a couple of weeks ago the um national statisticians um compl uh, watch up complained about the use of statistics and you know it was incredibly damning about how the government was using statistics but what it did I, weirdly was allow them a bit of breathing room a bit of wriggle room to say Actually, wait a minute, you know, everybody's wanting us to put our, our statistics on this, but, but now we have to, we have to slow down, we have to make sure that we do it correctly. And so I thought, I thought that was really interesting, and that was clearly the kind of game plan that, that Boris went into the, uh, to PMQs with. But then, thought, like no, he said, he's to make stuff on his hoof. <laughs> so yeah, on no. one hand, he's quite good at this, and then on the other hand, he kind of, were there kind of self-created problems? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, but I thought that was a, a mark of uh, Boris Johnson's weakness that, uh, you know, he's still having to fend off questions about uh, about race, uh, having tried to position himself as, you know, a liberal uh, pro-integration uh, Tory prime minister. Um, and yet, you know, the, the, that was the first question, wasn't it, from the SNP uh, asking about one of his advisors and her comments about whether this was just the politics of grievance. Uh, but you're right, he managed to turn that round into making him sound 
quite reasonable. But uh, on Keir Starmer, I thought, uh, I thought the Prime Minister came across as weak because he was in effect blaming Keir Starmer for the fact that he, he the Prime Minister, cannot get children back to school. Uh, and that, I don't think, is going to wash with people. And it was interesting as well, wasn't it, the line of like the union, you know, um, effectively something like a, a union is telling you what to, to think, which was a very strong line we saw from Tory leaders against um, Corbyn and against Ed Miliband. But at the minute, it's actually this government that needs unions and the support of unions. You know, never, ne you know, not for years have unions been so important to, yeah. the, to the business of government, to the everyday business of government. Um, and I thought it was interesting that, that this is, is now the point in which they think the tide has turned and that's a, a line of attack against Labour. Yeah, no, and, and a very colourful phrase about the great ox has stood on his tongue, um, which apparently is some, uh, is some classical reference, which uh, obviously, I mean, I didn't even get, so you know, what the general public's going to make of it. But I mean, it's a colourful phrase and it captures the view that, uh, that you know, Labour is the prison of the of the trade unions, but I just don't think that is going to cut much ice with parents who are desperate to get their children back to school uh, and think the government ought to sort it out. Uh, I don't think it's any use blaming the opposition for their failure to deliver. No, and it, I mean, it, in some ways it's a short term problem, isn't it? I mean, they just need to get to the end of this school term, but they barely got to Wednesday, um, yeah. you know, when a Manchester United Premiership footballer um, you know, realised that there was a problem with kids and schools and how things were organised. Um, and so it does, yeah, I agree with it. It does seem as if it's quite, it's quite, it, it, it is quite difficult. And the problem with parents is there's just so many of them. Yes. And they're much more likely to vote than some other members of some other groups. And, you know, yeah. through our Boris Johnson, you presumably have always seen yourself as a kind of Prime Minister who will be on the parent side, who will be appealing to parents. And yeah. so this is quite difficult for you. But then, um, I mean, I did think Keir Starmer's choice of questions was odd. I mean, he started off on, on child poverty, a very, uh, very good line of attack, obviously, um, for, for the Labour Party, although the Prime Minister just failed to understand the question. He thought he was asking about whether child poverty was going to rise in future, whereas uh, Keir Starmer was actually also asking about a rise which has already happened according to the government's own social mobility uh, commission. Uh, so they, they, they were just sort of talking past each other on that. But then Keir Starmer devoted several questions to, to local council funding, uh, where I'm afraid I think he just, he, he lost the house, he lost me, and then I think he lost the general public. I don't think uh, anybody could really follow the, the line of attack there. And that's probably the opposite of education and parents, isn't it? I mean, not that many local voters feel particularly sorry for the council. I mean, they don't like it when they start to see um, things cut. Um, but asking many voters to be particularly sympathetic to the, you know, local government finance is it, 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 it's a difficult it's a difficult task, isn't it? <laughs> and I thought maybe, and I thought it was really interesting when he said, when Boris said, um, "You're a witness." Yes, <laughs> or something like that. Now, and I thought, I thought it wasn't just a rhetorical flourish um, that said, you know, rubbish questions. Maybe you're being a bit lawyery, but I did wonder about. He's clearly taking Keir Starmer much more seriously now. Uh, yeah. He's clearly developing very specific lines of attack towards Keir Starmer as the Labour leader. Um, it does appear as if one of them is going to be about him being the lawyer. Yes. Um, so his failure to answer that question. I mean, I know the Prime Minister shouldn't be asking the leader of the opposition the question, but no. it's yeah. no use Keir Starmer just saying, oh, well, you know, this is Prime Minister's question time, not opposition leader's question time. He He... He failed to answer that question three times, and I think people will start to notice that. But I mean, on you know, uh, so so yeah, there's the. I think they were both weak, but I think the prime minister's weaker because he's the one who's failed to to deliver. And does does going on uh, his path 
question, but you know, former director of public prosecution, not an uncontroversial rule. Does that suggest where the Conservatives are starting to think their line of attack might be in future um, general elections? Um, that what they're trying to do is posit in the minds of, um, of the, the government now that this isn't um, the public now that this isn't just you know a regular um, leader of the opposition. Um, yeah, wasn't even an MP particularly long ago, and that his former job was a was as a lawyer with a you know controversial remit. Yeah, very good. I mean, obviously. Uh, he enjoys needling uh, Keir Starmer about being a lawyer and, and Keir mm. Starmer doesn't like it very much. So uh, we shall see more of that. Uh, but you, you mentioned at the beginning this business about no recourse to public funds. Now, that's quite complicated, isn't it? So can you explain what on earth is going on? Because that was a question from Stephen Timms, the Labour chair of the Work and Pension Select Committee. Yes, and, and well, I think to, to try and explain it, you probably have to go back to um, uh, at least three public appearances by the Prime Minister before. So um, this first came up when he was in front of the Liaison Committee last month, um, and he was asked about it. Um, and um, he um, appeared as if he wasn't um, across um, the full detail. Now, look, it's very difficult to say exactly what um, uh, what is going on in, in politicians' heads, but certainly it led to accusation from, from other MPs that he wasn't across the detail on it. Yeah, he sounded um, like never heard of it. <laughs> um, which, which you do wonder. I mean, you know, he hasn't actually been an MP for a, for a long time. I, you know, I, I wonder if that was, you know, um, it, 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 is, it is hard to imagine that um, MPs who do, as we know, do a lot of case work have have never come across that. I mean, that, that would be quite difficult to imagine, but of course, right. like I said, you, know, you can't really kind of understand what's going on in people's brains. Um, today, um, he was asked by Labour MPs. I thought it was a very clever question, which was back on the same issue, which he'd been on the back foot before, um, very specifically linked it to free school meals and said, um, at the very least, surely, surely they should be um, eligible for this. To which the Prime Minister said, well, yes, of course they should be, which, you know, I, just, I mean, that just makes, means that it's going to have to happen. That's how policies get changed if Prime Ministers stand up in the back books and say that they're going to have to happen. Um, and I, this will clearly be a great thing for, for, lots of, for lots of people out there who are struggling. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, brilliant. Well, I think uh, uh, that was, a, it was a, as you say, it was a very interesting uh, clash with the Prime Minister uh, saying quite a lot of new new things, which, as you say, a lot of uh, his his people are going to have to uh, clarify and clear up now. Uh, so we shall uh, we shall no doubt return to them next week. Yeah, one other thing I thought was really interesting was was all the stuff that suggested to me that there's trouble ahead for the Prime Minister, which I thought was really really interesting because obviously um, coronavirus has dominated for so long, and governments have to focus on when you're fighting global pandemic, that almost to, you know, to, to everything else. But there started to be quite a few questions, not just from opposition MPs, but from uh, Tory backbenchers that pointed to little, what I thought was a little bit of people starting to get a bit impatient. Um, I mean, there was a question about uh, soldiers and the long promised legislation um, yeah. To, um, soldiers uh, uh, abused. I mean, that, as you know, is a is an issue which fires up many Tory backbenchers in a way that cannot be underestimated. Yeah, yeah, that and was Bob Stewart, wasn't it? Asking about vexatious claims against uh, soldiers who served in Northern Ireland. Uh, you're right. I mean, t Tory backbenchers. Um, very agitated about that, and nothing has happened for for weeks and weeks. And that, you know, and, and you you kind of mess with that at yeah, your peril. Um, I would suggest um, now. Look, I'm not saying you know it's a it's a complex issue, uh, and it was always going to be incredibly difficult to get legislation on it before we face the global pandemic. Um, yeah. 
but I mean, you know, if, you, if you're if you're a prime minister who's already had to use term limits for bit because um, Tory MPs um, started to get quite agitated, you know, I think I think I think this is I think this is a, a really interesting um, phenomenon, um, and I don't know what you think, but you know, he's got he's got EEs. He's got an easy majority. <laughs> you should have to worry about Tory backbenchers a lot less than Theresa May did. Well, yes, but an 80 majority isn't isn't worth what it used to be in in old money, is it? I mean, because MPs have become so used to um, yeah. exercising their power because they know that you know if the majority is 80, then if they can get 40 of them together, then they can change government policy, and they they've seen what happened even under Tony Blair, who had absolutely vast majority i mean the majority of 179 and then uh, 160 something and yet was still vulnerable to uh, rebellions uh, from his own from his own party because i think you know the the sort of structure of discipline in the house of commons has changed in in recent decades and you know majority of 80 could be could be nothing and we've seen and as you say uh, you know in many ways the prime minister gives the impression of being pushed around by his uh, by his backbenchers <laughs> one of the kind of great untold stories of, of modern politics, isn't it? That you just, you know, that you, your, your majority, as you say, is just not what it used to be. Um, yeah. And you have to watch out for these. Um, especially the, um, the new MPs in those red wall seats who won their seats and are working incredibly hard to try and cement them. They seem to hold us way. Um, Certainly other Tory MPs um, tell me that, you know, they're, if the Red Wall MPs uh, are concerned about something, uh, it carries much more weight than their numbers. Which I think That's right. Whereas the tradition used to be that you know, new MPs would keep their nose clean, uh, vote loyally with the government in order to get promoted as junior ministers. But uh, mm. th that kind of rule doesn't seem to apply anymore. Well, look, I mean, and there's the other problem, um, which I thought when Jeremy Wright stood up, which is, you know, okay, you've got a new prime minister as of last July, but actually, they've been, you know, as a party, they've been in government for 10 years, and you just have an awful lot of former senior ministers yes. sitting on these black benches, knowing where the bodies are buried, nothing to lose, not going to be brought back in anybody's cabinet, no greasy pool to play. Yes. Um, not unprepared to cause trouble at times. Yeah, they're very dangerous people. People like Sajid Javid, Jeremy Hunt. Um, yeah, we've got to look out for them. Well, look, thank you very much, Kate. That was a fascinating discussion. And uh, we look forward to uh, talking to you again next week or soon thereafter. Now I've got to work out how to switch this thing off. <laughs> so we've got to leave the meeting.